He was an enlightened artist and author, a gifted teacher and mentor, a visionary, an intergalactic psychic time traveler, and he was my friend. Uh, so I want to talk to you about two of his gifts today, his art and remote viewing. Ingo was a visionary artist. Many of his paintings are on display here at the American Visionary Art Museum. And I'm sure as Ingo wanders through the halls of this museum, he's very happy to see the joy on the faces of the people experiencing his artwork. But Ingo's artwork graces the halls of many other museums, to include four at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. But while he is widely known for his art, Ingo is probably more widely known for being the father of remote viewing. And I'll, that's what I'm going to spend the rest of my time with today. So what is remote viewing? Remote viewing is the ability to perceive something that's remote from your body. In the early 70s, when Ingo was working with Stanford Research Institute developing psychic phenomena, there was an effort to try and get away from the old terms of out-of-body experience, psychic, um, astral projection, Ingo, knowing that he was viewing something that was remote from his physical body, said, why don't we use remote viewing? And so, even today, that's the most widely used term for being able to experience something remote from your physical body. But before I go on, there are a few questions I'm sure you want to ask. Is this for real? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Am I crazy? Well, while my wife Faye may disagree with me, I'm going to say no today. And does this have anything to do with goats? <laughs> no, no goats. So, from 1977 until 1995, the Army, in conjunction with other intelligence agencies, had an active remote viewing program. For security purposes, the names were changed every few years. It's most widely known for its last name, Stargate. So what is remote viewing? I'll show you a couple of sessions in just a moment so that you can get a better feel for what it is. But Ingo was able to break remote viewing down into discrete, trainable steps, and then he trained me. So, when the remote viewer is given a stimulus, for me most of the time it was a geographic coordinate, I would put the pen on the paper and an ideogram would be produced. You know, you've probably heard of automatic writing. An ideogram is a little squiggle on the line, or on the paper, that represents the primary gestalt of the site. And after you've processed the ideogram, then sensory impressions come. The, those sensory impressions that you're all experiencing right now from your normal five senses. Smells, tastes, textures, temperatures. After the sensory information comes, then dimensional references start to, become in, to come in. It's huge, it's large, it's long, but there's very little detail to that until stage four when those references become no longer huge, but now it's 50 feet by 37 feet. And sometimes those measurements are very accurate. Also in stage four is when tangibles come in. Tangibles are things, cars, trucks, trees, um, buildings. And stage five is integration and interrogation of the data. Integration meaning I said there's a building there and there's a tree there. How are they related? How close are they? And then you can interrogate the data. I said, there's a tree there. Is it a deciduous tree or is it a, a evergreen? Is it alive? Is it dead? Is it large? Is it small? And so that's stage five. And then stage six is a three-dimensional model of the site. Now Ingo trained me on stages one through six. Stage seven, verbal sounds or phonetics just started spontaneously presenting themselves toward the end of my training, and I'll show you some of those. Now on this graph, 
resolution is on the vertical axis and the different stages go across the bottom axis. And you can see that the dashed line is the lemon. That's the threshold of our conscious mind. So you, what you can see there is that most of the remote viewing session takes place in the subconscious mind, subliminally. And so the difficult part is trying to get it from there to objectify it on paper. But as you work through the stages, you become more and more aware of what is at that location. And at some point, you likely become consciously aware of where you are. So let me give you a couple examples of this. This is an early stage two site. Stage twos are just the ideogram and the sensations that you're all experiencing right now. So this, and you can see it's been declassified by the CIA. That's what the little black writing is. I took the coordinate for the site from Ingo and produced an ideogram. I said it's solid, it's land. And that's all I got from the first presentation. So I took the coordinate again. A similar but different ideogram was produced. I said it's flat land. And then stage two's sensory data started coming in. Um, hard, rough, grainy, brown, morning light, dry. It stopped there. So I took the coordinate one more time. A similar coordinate, or similar, similar ideogram was produced. <laughs> And then you can see long, flat. Those are those dimensionals that I mentioned. So this is really starting to get close to stage three. Finally, an AI is an aesthetic impact. That's the body acknowledging how this site is affecting me. And in my uh, turn, blah. I said, this is a noisy, smelly, busy place. It's an airport. And in fact, that's what it was. So on two pieces of paper and three prompts of the coordinate, I was able to say that there was a airport there. So if that's what stages one and two can tell us, let's see what stages six and seven can tell us. In 1983, the Army had spent a lot of money sending me all over with Ingo to train me. They wanted to see if they were getting their money's worth out of Ingo's training. So they gave us 19, and I can't tell you why 19 and not 20 or 15, but 19 sites. They wanted to see if Ingo's training was actually working. So the stage six model that I produced, you see there, and the stage sevens, and these were, this was one of the very first sites I ever I ever had stage seven, so you can see I was struggling to get on paper what I was hearing in my mind and what my mouth was trying to say. But I said the best I could come up with was bucker. So that's the model and bucker. And here's the feedback. And it was actually Bunker Hill Monument. So from simply being read the coordinates, this is what one can learn. And I'll go through a couple other ones briefly. Here's the model stage six that was produced. I said it was an old pyramid structure. You can see the stage sevens that I was struggling with. I said Tulu is the best I can do. Here's the feedback. And it was Tulum Pyramid in Mexico. And about three years later, Ingo and I actually went down to Mexico exploring some of the ruins and we went to Tulum. And it was pretty amazing to actually experience it physically, what he and I had only been to psychically before. Here's the model. I stage seven grand, that, came, that word came out very well. And here's the feedback. And it was the Grand Cooley Dam in Washington. And one last one, this site, if you see all the little dots there, I said each one of those dots represents one of those little spires. Thank you. Stage seven started coming in. AOL is analytical overlay. That's my brain's way of giving me images that try to match up with the perception that I'm receiving. So I knew it wasn't a pine cone, but that was the closest thing that I could say. So I, I declared that. <coughs> It was, I said it was a nuclear plant. It sounds like something like E. Conti. And here's the feedback. 
and it was Oconee nuclear power plant. Now you can see the small spires here. Now I did this enough that not too many things amazed me, but the most amazing thing to me was this little egg on a stick that you see here. I, I drew and then modeled the site, but I kept feeling like something was to the back. And it didn't make any sense, an egg on a stick. But Ingo said, you know, do it, make it. So I made it, and you can see, there it is. So to me, that was very surprising. But that was 32 years ago. Let's move into this millennium. In 2011, Ingo had a few friends over to his place. That's Ingo in the middle. And he asked me if I would do a remote viewing session for the assembled group. Now, I had never performed before an audience before. I had never been filmed before. And it had been 26 years since I did it. But when he asked, what could I say? So I, I did it. Um, so I thought you would like to see what does an actual remote viewing session look like. Um, I start by clearing my mind, and I'm not going into a trance or anything like that. I'm just clearing all the perceptions that I have, trying to let my body go away, all the sensations that I'm experiencing at the time. And then when I put my pen down on the paper, that's Ingo's cue to go ahead and read me the coordinates. Now this particular session, I said it was a land-water interface before he even read the coordinate to me. A land-water interface is a place where water and land come together. Now, why do we say land-water interface? Well, we learn to be very accurate with our verbiage. If I had said it was an island, well, and maybe it wasn't. All I knew is that land and water were coming together at this site. So you might be saying, oh, he knew what it was before the coordinate was even read. Well, to me, that was a lack of discipline. I felt like I was letting my, my master down there. So I took the coordinate. You can see the ideogram and the stage two starting to present themselves. I said it was, in fact, a land-water interface. It was a waterfall. Bridal Vale Falls came said there was a man-made structure nearby. And then I ended the session saying, okay, the site is a large waterfall with man-made structure nearby, Bridal Veil Falls. And here's the feedback that was provided. You can see it's Niagara Falls. So I thought, well, I really let him down. I let the session start before he read the coordinates to me. And I called Niagara Falls, Bridal Veil Falls. Well, it wasn't until three years later I was giving a presentation on this, somebody in the audience held their hand up and said, are you aware that Niagara Falls on the American side is called Bridal Veil vale Falls? <laughs> so I was amazed. I didn't, know, I didn't know that. As soon as my presentation was over, I went out to the lobby to call Ingo and let him know, and somebody had already called him and told him. <laughs> so after 26 years, it still works. It made Ingo very happy. If you want to learn more about the Army's Stargate program or want to learn more about remote viewing, these are some resources that are available to you. The International Remote Viewing Association is a group of people who are continuing to develop remote viewing and see what it can, what it can do. And as Rebecca said, yesterday was the second anniversary of Ingo's passing. And in Purple Fables, one of his 14 books that he wrote, um, the Sayer of Tales told him, I can't say there are places to go and things to see. But your own mind's eyes can see their own tales if you let them. And you can see more than tales if you let them also. So Ingo, a gifted artist and writer, Unbeknownst to the rest of the world, had the secret light working with America's intelligence agencies. And he didn't do that at all. That concludes my presentation.